And we're live. We are live. It is Thursday morning, 11 o'clock Central Time. It is time for the .NET Docs. We need theme music. We should totally have music. I think there's other more successful uh, streams that have music playing all the time. So the cool thing is... I mean, I, I'm a musician, so I could... Uh, you're a musician too, aren't you, Dave? Yeah, we should do our own music. We should. It'd be a, a combination of your beautiful, like, melodic feel, like, you know, transient, like, just put people in... And then I'd be, like, death metal screaming in the... <laughs> <laughs> could, could we do your death metal screaming with... Like, I could do, like, some my jazz thing, right? And and we just do... Like think like Frank Sinatra or or um, um, uh, you know Dino or somebody and mm -hmm. but but instead of like that musical style but with your 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 death metal screaming. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be uh, it'd be different. That's like a whole new genre. And then uh, I anyways. can do uh, the interpretive dance, and I'm trying to think through <laughs> what would interpretive dance look like for C sharp nine records. Uh, uh... <laughs> I'll put some thought into that, and you know, yeah. if I can think of anything good, I'll let you know. Cool. So, how so what do we have for the show today? Well, we had the first virtual build ever, didn't we? That was pretty impressive. We did. I know um, Cam um, got to deliver a, a workshop, a learn live session. Now, how did that go? <laughs> so um, it, it was my very first build session. I was really excited by that. Um, so I, I got on there, and the way that they do the teams, um, the the teams meetings for these things, because of the, the you know they, they have this whole teams live events thing, and they're they're organizing it through a vendor. So the vendor has a separate Azure AD tenant set up for us to log into and, and run through Teams. And what I didn't realize, and I think Brady realized this on, on his, um, I think Brady already figured this out. Um, what I didn't realize is logging, logging into that other tenant messed up some stuff in, uh, in the Visual Studio authentication stack. And this was bad because my session was the um, it was the, the learn module is we called a learn uh, studio session. It was going through the learn module that is published to Azure App Service from Visual Studio. So Visual Studio couldn't talk to Azure App Service, and and you know we get to that part of the demo, and I'm like, well, that's that's fun, and I'm I'm hammering against authentication. <laughs> Every time I log into Visual Studio, it works for about ten seconds, and then it kicks me out. So I'm like in the publish dialogue, and I'm just showing my resource groups and showing my uh, uh, hosting plans and all that. I'm selecting and selecting, and then it just kicks me out. Nope, need to sign in again. Okay, yeah. sign in again. Do all that again. Won't publish. Need to sign in again. Um, and my my producer for for this session, he had seen something similar to this. I think Brady had tweeted something earlier, maybe or sent out an email. I just missed it. Um, but he had he had tagged me in the in the chat for the meeting. I just didn't see it, but he thought it was this tenant thing. Um, anyway, the session ended up not being publishing to <clears throat> App Service from Visual Studio. It ended up publishing to a folder from Visual Studio and then FTPing from that folder to App Service. The attendees dug it, and and like the uh, you know our friend uh, here in Docs, uh, Adrian Stevens, was moderating the call, and he was he was playing up. Oh wow, this is this is cool. This is you know we get to see somebody troubleshoot and everything. But man, I would have liked my first build experience to not have been you know the demos blowing up and going down in flames, right? Well, it <laughs> sounds like you survived. Uh, my question to you is, uh, was there any useful feedback that you saw in the chat? Um, or you know any was there any theme to the questions that you were getting in your session? Uh, you know what what was funny is you so you and I moderated a session. Our our friend Myra had done the the same session, and you and I were the moderators. And we we saw some questions that were um, we saw a couple that were surprising. We saw a few people that that they didn't know you could run multiple installations of Visual Studio side by side, right? So we'd wow. go into the Visual Studio installer to show the show the workload stuff, and and you know they saw Myra had like I don't know like eight different versions of Visual Studio installed, and they're like, <laughs> what? How how do the, do those all take up gigabytes of space? And so there were a lot of questions about that. And um, on mine, you know, I got to be honest, Adrian and my other moderator was Renee. I had, I've never met Renee. He's a um, He's uh, another content developer like like us from uh, he he's based in France, however, 
and um, uh, Adrian and Renee handled all the questions. None of the questions bubbled up to me except for the stuff around when I was just, you know, improvising and trying to work around that issue. And then we got questions about like, how does the FTP work? How does, you know, do I accept this certificate when I connect from my FTP client and, and all this other stuff. So uh, we got some good questions and they were all very ad hoc because the session was just ad hoc. That's sure. Cool. Well, congrats on your first session, man. Uh, even though your demo uh, didn't go as planned, you were still able to succeed at your goal of deploying the thing. So that's awesome. Kudos. Um, I'm very jealous of both of you because I wanted to do a build session. It's been a long time dream of mine. So hopefully maybe next year we can make that happen. Hey, everyone gets lucky. Um, I chalk this opportunity up to pure luck in my case. Uh, being in the right place at the right time is, is really what it was. Um, but what else? You know, so I guess what we wanted to focus on today is what were some of the cool things we saw at Build? Um, for me, one of the big announcements was uh, the Windows Terminal hitting general availability. Uh, so this is a tool that I've used uh, extensively. Uh, you know, I use it daily in my day-to-day -day, um, docs work. Um, using tools like Posh Git and Oh My Posh inside of the Windows Terminal. Um, so again, that was to me, one of the bigger announcements, there was also this um, WSL2 announcement, mm -hmm. the Windows subsystem for Linux. Haven't had a chance to play around with that yet. Have either of you? I, I missed the announcement. So uh, you're going to have to fill me in on that one, Scott. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I have WSL, but not WSL2. Our, our, our close, our, our good friend, uh, uh, SP Boyer out in the chat is uh, commented code spaces. Code space is a huge one. And oh, um, yeah. to, to that, I've been playing around. I've got a lot of ideas for how we can do interactive learning using code spaces. Uh, I want to play around with some, some conceptual ideas with you guys offline and, and, and we can hopefully start, hopefully start plugging that to our management and see if we can't do something interesting around that. Yeah. I, I love that. It's um, like the IDE experience in the cloud is based off of, like Visual Studio Code, because I just love Visual Studio Code. I live in it, and um, having having that type of parity and familiarity with, you know, something that you're used to using is awesome. I love that that you can sync like the features, like they show how you can sync the settings, and that's just amazing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, SP Boyer Shane is asking, could you do docs development in Code Spaces? Oh, you absolutely um, could. You absolutely 100% could. Um, so actually, actually, Shane, I'm glad you're you're viewing today because I could use your help in figuring out this container stuff because it's I'm I'm kind of new to containerization, but it's all containers driven in code spaces. You can you can set up an environment container that has you know everything you need like. Um, uh, the, whatever whatever tool chain you need, uh, you can have it uh, add whatever extensions you need to Visual Studio slash you know the the Visual Studio Online. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things to explore there that I'm looking forward to. In fact, Cam, weren't you and I just talking about doing that a couple of days ago with Microsoft Learn modules? Mm -hmm. I think we had proposed the idea. Uh, we didn't actually explore it because we were in a time crunch, but we still are in a time crunch. <laughs> yeah, here we are streaming. Imagine how uh, meta that would be, you know, writing docs about using code spaces, and then the doc is about, you know, how to use code spaces to write docs. Like, just that'd be kind of cool. So, we have another idea then for a, a future episode. Um, you know, another thing while we have Mr. Uh, Pine on the show with us, C Sharp 9 was a big announcement for .NET developers. Yeah. And I had heard through the grapevine that David had some C Sharp 9 goodness to share with us today. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. So I uh, I shared my screen. I don't know if you can see it, Cam, so if you could switch over to that. 
So we're going to look at some C sharp fun stuff here. And uh, total disclaimer: I literally just borrowed a bunch of the bits that I saw from Mads um, session, which is Mads Torgensen. He's the lead designer on C sharp. So I'm super inspired by all the awesome stuff that they're doing there. So the amazing thing about C sharp is it's developed in the open. All the features you can follow the features through their lifetime, and the lifetime of a feature is basically someone proposes an idea and then if it's uh, you know gets enough interest, then it moves on to a different stage, which is prototyping it. So someone actually tries, you know, after there's been enough dis discussion around it, and they've kind of have like a design idea, you can prototype it, and then it gets slated for if the prototype works out, advancing into becoming something that the language actually adopts and and makes official. So there's some cool things with C sharp nine that were shown off, um, and I want to talk about records uh, first and foremost. So Records are pretty amazing. Um, what they do is they remove the need for some of the boilerplate code that you might anticipate. So like if I start off here and we just have a public class uh, person, uh, this class could be uh, pretty straightforward, right? You'd have your string, which is a first name. You know, a person has a first name. They have a last name. They have all these, um, you know, various properties that are pretty straightforward. And uh, one of the reasons you might want to write a getter setter like this with the auto properties is that you could then instantiate your person with um, an object initializer, right? So you could say var person equals oh, new person. Uh, first name, last name, right? And then the problem with this, though, becomes quickly that your your object is actually um, mutable because those properties both have a getter and setter. So you might want to choose to have uh, a constructor that makes these, you know, private set. Private, if I can spell correctly. Uh, and then you assign those inside the constructor. Uh, you got to get the point, right? So there's different things. There's different advantages to having those types of data structures. Uh, so one of the things that they've done was uh, with the introduction of um, records. And mind you, this is in Sharp Lab IO. So this is all um, kind of prototype bits, literally pointing at different releases of the Roslyn compiler in the browser. Uh, so that's how I'm playing with this stuff. Um, so what they did was they added the, a new um, modifier here, or keyword rather. So you can say public data class and give it the name of you know the class and then you can say string first name string last name and then just close it i mean you could you could have it open if you wanted but you can just close it by a semicolon and this basically serves as an immutable data structure right so now once we instantiate that right we've got a person here named david pine we can work with that person um, the idea is that you can start to uh, use more immutable data structures within C Sharp, which is hasn't been something that's been super prevalent, especially with you know object initializers and auto properties, as we demonstrated just before. Uh, and then they have some neat things where they've added the with expression. Now, in this current environment, this is a May 12 um, build, so the with expressions don't actually work uh, for whatever reason. So if you were to look at their actual demonstration in their IDE, they have like, you know, dog fooding bits of the, the IDE, which is pretty slick. But you get the idea. You could say per uh, person with a last name Fowler. So then changing David Pine to David Fowler, which would be pretty amazing. <laughs> and then you write the person <laughs> out. <laughs> um, uh, but it's, it's immutable, right? So person isn't changed, but then you get like a shallow copy. And then you get some other... Uh, cool um, greatness, which is you know value-based equality. So if the the values of record types are equivalent in terms of their values, you could do comparisons, and it's it's pretty slick. So that's that's record types. If you want to actually play with this sample in the browser, I put together an aka link here. So aka dot ms forward slash c sharp hyphen records. Okay, I have questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so let let me let me see if I review. So let me see if I if I caught what's going on here. So uh -huh. 
the the public data class person string first name string last name that becomes the whole that's the whole class definition that so like string first name string last name is telling it hey you need two string properties named first name and last name exactly so and it does a lot more than just that so this is on the right side you actually get the c sharp equivalent of the class that's been compiled so we can look at what it's actually doing so you end up with a, a property here so you get the public class person you get the backing fields for each of these these are uh, obviously read only fields um, and you get a public read only property which is you know just only a get accessor that returns the backing fields right so that's essentially what auto properties were doing before um, you know, interacting with the backing field and exposing it publicly through the property. But these are get only, right? So the only way that you can actually initialize those is from a constructor. The constructor here then is public, first name, last name, and it assigns to the backing fields. And then you get equality, right? It does uh, several more things, which is pretty, pretty slick. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's pretty much as simple as that. This single line statement here for this data structure generates this equivalent class for you. How does that work with something like, say, Entity Framework? I, I uh, yeah, I don't know. That's that's a good question. This is, again, all, all, all very, very, very new. <laughs> In fact, it's not even available um, with the latest bits of Visual Studio uh, 2019 and .NET, uh, .NET 5. So, I, I'm not even sure how to get some of these things. This is the only way I was able to get at these is, is through the browser with Sharp Lab pointing to different release branches of Roslyn. Oh, okay. Well, and that, by the way, is my next question. What is the Sharp Lab thing? I've never seen it before. Yeah, Sharp Lab IO is uh, basically a community uh, project by um, this individual. And. It's been around for a long time, and what it does is, let's just open up a new one here, Sharp Lab IO. You go to there, and um, you can create a gist from it. You can choose different languages. Uh, I always play around in C Sharp, and then you get the various Roslyn branches, so you could target different features um, from a branch, uh, or you can target framework or different platforms and then you can either run it look at the il look at the jit as um syntax tree verification explanation of the different things it's it's a really really powerful way to kind of explore the inner workings of um c sharp how things are compiled and kind of you get a bit closer sense of how roslyn interacts with these things so i use it quite a bit well um, very very cool i for, i see myself using it quite a bit <laughs> so that's that's records. I actually have three other things that we can look at. So I've prepared uh, top level statements, and top stuff. Uh, top level statements are pretty neat. So uh, I mean, there's a lot of boilerplate code that exists, right? So when we have you know using static uh, system dot council, this is our our using statements, obviously, uh, and then we've got our program class, and then you have your static void main. I made this simply an expression body, you know, right line. So it says we're running it now. So hi .NET friends. This is a simple council app with an expression bodied main. It's not super exciting, um, right? So we can do the same thing here with um, task returning mains, right? That's pretty straightforward. Uh, so now we have async and await. We can await a task. Uh, they added that I think in 7.1 of, of C sharp. Um, that's not super exciting either. I think it's complaining about me not having a using for that. Let me pull up using. Whoops. Press buttons. System. Dot threading. Threading dot tasks. Okay. And then that should run, I think. Or it doesn't. Oh. Okay. Anyways, well, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kill this all together. This is something, this is the boilerplate code you had before, and it was great. So now with top-level statements, you can actually just have an entire executable that lives as a statement. And so imagine like, you know, C-sharp scripting or like council apps, for example. This might be applicable to just have a series of statements that run um, with no boilerplate for like your, your static main entry point. And the amazing thing is you actually still get access to arcs, 
right? So args is contextually given to us because args was the name that was available uh, in, in your main thing. So you would say uh, args, whoops, dot length, right? That is the actual ar args object from, from the command line, right? So var length. So that's that's totally fine. There's nothing there. So um, this you can also use. Uh, so oh, so so this opens up. Doesn't this opens up using C sharp for for scripting? Doesn't it? I I yeah I believe so. Well, so my question there is, how would that differ from like a CSX file? Um, which uh, essentially is C sharp scripting. Yeah, I don't I don't actually know. This By is all way, so uh, new. I'm That's finally cool. just chiming in now. I uh, fixed my audio. My mic had stopped working. Oh, that's good. We just thought you were like blown away with C sharp nine stuff, and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> there was that. You know, you blew my socks off with the records demo, and I had to find a new pair. Uh, so now I'm tuning back into this. One comment I was going to make here for folks who haven't seen it. I know I personally haven't seen a lot of this in the wild is you're using static statement at the top there. I believe that was, what, a C-sharp 7 or 7.1 feature, something like that? Yeah, 7.1. And uh, should we briefly explain what that is for folks who haven't seen using static? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I use it for, like, council apps all the time. Um, so using static, uh, actually, that might... No, using static was, I think, six. That's older. This is C-sharp six. I'm calling it C-sharp six. Um, so using static lets you actually interact with uh, any static member uh, that exists uh, with a using statement. So we can say, like, math, for example. And what are some things that live off of math? Um, how about... You can uh, round. You can... Um, round. I guess rounding is the first thing that comes to mind because that's the most recent... Um, thing I've used it for. There you go. So round. So you can directly interact with uh, the math object in this context because you're using it statically. Does that make sense? So in, in the context of uh, our file here, imagine this is a file. Uh, you can interact with uh, math, any of the math statically exposed members. So 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 to phrase it a different way, so we're, we're used to seeing using in terms of like namespaces, right? In in mm -hmm. this case, we're we're using a static object, and and it, it, it's ambiently available to us through through you know the the future lines of code. So we can just call the the static methods on that object, right? Is that is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Static methods on that class, rather. Yeah. Cool. And static static members. So if there's if there's properties, if there's uh, methods, whatever they are. Yep. Uh, so yeah, that's that's that. So we can say like mouth, uh, or sorry, right line, which comes from council, uh, round, since that comes from math. Given this, and you can see like the highlighting over there, system dot math dot round. It knows that round is there. So that's pretty neat. Um, so anyways, that's top level statements. And again, if you want that, go to aka.ms.top hyphen level hyphen statements, and you'll get this uh, current environment. Uh, so the next thing is target uh, targeted type new uh, expressions. So this is pretty slick. Uh, it, it's just a kind of a minor feature. It's not super uh, exciting, but um, Imagine that we've got this simple object, uh, foo, and it takes on a bar um, int as its uh, uh, parameter, um, constructor, you know, required parameter. And we express that as bar equals bar. And that's just a property sitting on it. Let's make this private set, private set. <clears throat> okay. And so we can instantiate uh, fee here uh, as a new foo1. Uh, but, you know, we, we like using var. I like using var, right? Uh, but if you want to get, exp I mean, the reason we can use var is because foo is known, right? So, uh, but if we wanted to say foo, some people like explicitly typing their declarations, and that's totally fine too. But if you do explicitly type your, uh, your declarations, you can actually now, with this feature, omit the type when you're instantiating it. 
So you can no. say... You you called this minor. To me, that's a game changer. <laughs> that's going to save me a lot of keystrokes. I, um, I mean, it is, but I don't know if I like it. <laughs> that just seems wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit indifferent. I think it's pretty slick. Uh, so imagine that you have this really ridiculous name. Would you rather? Would you want to type that ridiculous name twice? No, you're right. No, essentially, what it is is it's it's var for the other side of the equal sign, right? I mean, yeah, you can't say var here, though, right? Right, right, right. What what, what I'm saying though is the whole the whole intent of var is to say, okay, I know what the object is on the right side of the equal sign, so I don't care what it is on the left, and that that's flipping that around. So now we know what it is on the left. We don't care what it is on the right. Let the compiler figure it out. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, this is sort of like a tabs versus spaces question here, <laughs> but what are your thoughts on var versus the explicit type? I I prefer using var every everywhere. I var all the things. I can't, ex I just, I don't like the explicit type. I don't know why. Like for me, uh, my this is and this is just my personal preference. And I know that there's two very sides of the fence. Um, I should be able to infer the type by reading it. So var is almost a keyword that's unnecessary altogether. Like, let me just say here's my variable, and the variable name itself. I don't want it to have the name of the type in it, but for the context I'm in. I want to be able to look at the variable name and kind of know how to interact with it. And the type should be just an, uh, almost anonymous, right? It should just be, I don't care. I don't care what the type is. So, so I, I, I have a question about that. Outlook. <laughs> did you, did you learn JavaScript or C sharp first? I learned VB first. Hmm. V, v, VB six or earlier or VB.net. VB.net. Oh, Demo. really? That's so surprising Demo. to me. Yeah. So, so Cam, I, what are your thoughts on that? Are oh, you a var? I'm var supporter. Typing. Now, I mean, I when, when when I'm sitting here hacking around, I'll var, right? But when I'm doing my refactoring and making the code pretty before I commit it, those vars go right out the window because I, I like the explicit typing. Yeah, there. Are, you know, I see both sides of the fence. Um, I'm a huge fan of var, um, but only in cases where it is extremely clear to whoever's reading the code that that's what the type is. For example, you know, var test equals new foo. It's very clear that that variable is of type foo because I am instantiating that object on the right side of the equals sign. But there may be cases where, you know, maybe that type isn't obvious and you have to actually hover over the method being invoked to determine what's being returned. In a case like that, I actually prefer using the explicit type over var. Well, and LQDev1 chimes in, you know, he, he says he vars all the things um, mm -hmm. because for yep. instruction and teaching, but he says for instruction and teaching, the explicit types are helpful. And I think that might be why I, I always keep going back to the explicit types is just, you know, habit from, from documentation, you know, being in a few doc reviews where folks call me out and go, hey, don't use var in this doc, you know, um, that, that might be where my preference comes from. I don't know, uh, like, so you, for example, are, are choosing this right here, dictionary string i enumerable of foo dictionary equals new dictionary string i enumerable. It's like, oh my god, that's a mouthful. I don't want to have to type all that stuff. Luckily, while you guys were ranting about uh, why I'm a moron, I got, <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got to type all this stuff up, right? No. Uh, so you can do var, which is pretty straightforward and great, but yeah, to your point, you, know, you can flip it, right? We can just say new if the type is already defined. So it's kind of slick and this mm -hmm. totally compiles and it knows what it's doing and it's the the world's a happy place. I actually see myself using that more than using var. <clears throat> and if you're a real animal and you're living in TypeScript, you wouldn't say var, but you could say uh, D equals new. You don't even say new, right? But and then you can start playing with things, but that's not, we're not going to get into that. Maybe we'll have a, an episode on just TypeScript. Uh, so if you want to play around with this demo, um, aka.ms forward slash target hyphen type hyphen new. Uh, let's, let's, I got one more for you here, and then we can 
jump back out and talk more casually about stuff. So uh, with the advent of C Sharp 7, we were gifted the amazing ability of pattern matching. And it seems like with every incremental advancement in C Sharp, they give us more pattern matching love. There's been some amazing uh, advances. And I remember when it first came out, I was just totally blown away. I was like, holy cats, this is amazing, right? Uh, and it just keeps getting better. So with C Sharp 9, they even have uh, more improvements. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with pattern matching as like a general content uh, subject, or uh, I I uh, I have this tutorial link here. Um, it is a tutorial on pattern matching. So uh, docs.microsoft.com.net C sharp tutorials pattern matching. Go check it out. Uh, but with that said, this is actually highlighting some of the advancements of the pattern matching capability. So I'm going to show you that we have uh, uh, we've got vehicles that we're interacting with today. We've got a car that's got some passengers. We've got a delivery truck that's got a gross weight. We've got a taxi that has, you know, obviously taxi fares, a bus with capacity and riders. So just some simple objects to kind of think about um, how we might interact with these things, right? And then so we'll instantiate various things. Uh, and we have this function called calculate toll. So calculate toll, it takes a T a vehicle. Um, let's just let's even let's change this real quick. We don't need a T. It could just be any object, right? A completely a anything, anything that's possible in C sharp. So whatever the object is, this this method here is smart enough to figure it out. So enter. Uh, so there's so many things going on here. We're going to try to try to digest it a bit. So there's first of all, it's a static decimal calculate toll function that takes an object named vehicle, and we express that object as um, walking up to the vehicle and switching on it. So these are switch expressions now. Switch expressions were introduced in C-sharp 8. So with switch expressions, we could do cool things like infer that this vehicle was in fact a car. So if the type was, this is just a type pattern, so type uh, vehicle of type car C, and then now we can express that as um, in, in this context, C is now a car, and then we can interact with passengers and do more stuff. Uh, so based on the number of passengers, we would switch on that and then do calculations and return our toll. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, if the type was a taxi, we could then walk up to the fares. And these are things that, again, that have been around for a little while now. So the fun stuff that I want to talk about is before, when we would default into, let's just say that we had a fare of three point this. Let's just change this real quick. So imagine that we had a taxi T. Um, so before C sharp nine, we actually had to say T. We had to provide an identifier. Now with uh, type patterns, we can just omit that altogether. We don't need that. So if vehicle is a taxi, if that's the type of thing that we're interacting with, we can express the toll being calculated as three point. One five, and we're done, right? Uh, so now down here, let's get into like a delivery truck. So if the delivery truck, we gotta, uh, we're gonna identify that as T, and we're then going to express it as um, its gross weight class, and then we're gonna have like a nested switch expression here. So really cool things that they've added were relational patterns. Relational patterns, if you're familiar with switch case labels altogether, you know, imagine uh, walking up to the gross weight and trying to have that in a switch expression or a switch statement. Historically, you'd have to have every single finite value in there, right? Um, and that was troublesome. So you'd end up having like if else statements. So now with relational patterns, you can actually express those as greater than or less than. Uh, so we can say less than 3,000 is expressed as 10 minus 2.0. Or if it's greater than or equal to 3,000 and less than or equal to 5,000, uh, and this is where we introduce some of the new logical patterns, which are um, and, or, and not. So we get some new keywords to play with, which are going to be super powerful here in a second. Um, and then if it's greater than 5,000, that's expressed as this. So this will return what you'd expect, and we'll look at that in a second. Uh, and then some of our fall-through stuff. So we could we could say null before, 
uh, before that we had like uh, you could just say like an empty object or you could even do like a catch all uh, so just completely discard it all together but what they actually introduced is not null so you can say not uh, and instead of saying like um, before you'd have to like kind of negate it with the bang. <clears throat> now you actually just say not null, and it's pretty slick. That so, actually takes me back to my VB.net days, where you could <laughs> say is not nothing. It's sort of like the same yep. thing. Yep. Uh, yeah. So that's that's that running right there. So like yeah, you can say if bus is not null. That's like a valid statement before. And what you had to say before C sharp nine is you'd have to actually negate that. You'd have to say, if not, uh, bus. Oops. <clears throat> bus. Why is it doing that? Don't do that. Bus. Is. Uh, is null. And you'd have to negate it. So you'd have to say bus is null, because there was no way to express the, the negation of that. So you'd have to wrap it in parens and then bang it out. So. <clears throat> so yeah, there's some cool stuff here to go play around with and try to wrap your head around and enjoy. Uh, so the link for that one is aka.ms forward slash pattern forward or hyphen matching hyphen uh, improvements. We actually have a good question in the chat for you, David, uh, from our good friend Blackbeard Matt. Is there pattern matching for function arguments? Uh, pattern matching for function arguments. So let me think about that. I guess I'm curious what, what, what do you guys think that would mean? And Blackbeard Matt, that's that's my buddy. I know Blackbeard Matt. Um, function arguments. So let's let's start. Maybe we could just hack on it here live and see what yeah. happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's try that. All right. I'm so, honestly not sure. <clears throat> so. What what's our function gonna look like? Function. So what are we doing? Pattern matching on the arguments. Yep, that, that's I mean, what it that, sounds like. So that's kind of what we're doing here, right? So like I guess calculate toll is a function. We are given this argument and we're doing pattern matching on it. Right? Is that is that what we're saying? So object, let me just say vehicle. Ah. Um, and then we could say, I mean, that, that's, that's essentially what this is, but with switch expressions. So we can say, uh, if vehicle is not null, right? We could do something like that, which is totally valid, but that's essentially what we were actually doing before with the switch expression. So we were saying, uh, given this, um, object, we could switch on it. The final case is if it's null. And if it's not null, we would, you know, throw this because we haven't identified a case label for it. So essentially, I mean, the, the answer is yes, uh, we can. I guess if there's anything specific, though, uh, this would be a void. So we can compile again. Now I want to go ahead. So, so Matt's saying it's similar to what Elixir does. Um, if either of you have used Elixir, I know I have not. No, that's but. interesting. I have not either. I'm not familiar with that. I should look into it. Um, Blackbeard Matt, uh, I'll investigate, um, but at me on Twitter, and I'll uh, I'll respond accordingly. I'll and try to add more detail in there with the specific ask or like an example maybe of what Elixir is doing. And, you know, that might actually be a good example to incorporate into the docs if it is possible. Um, creating work for you here on the stream, David. Yeah. I was going to say drink elixir. Yeah. That's, not, <laughs> that's, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, I always love more work. So, hey, you know, while you're here and we're looking at these C sharp switch expressions, mm -hmm. um, something that comes to mind. So if we go to your calculate toll function, mm -hmm. would I be able to, um, let's say, let's look at your, your zero case statement there. Mm -hmm. um, so up from where you are now, could I say something like zero comma three and have what's on the right side of the arrow apply to both zero and three, or would three have to be a separate case? Ah, uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. The, uh, cause ranges exist, right? How do we express ranges? I forget how to do that. 
Yeah. And it, uh, was it dot dot? Yeah. That's the, yeah, there it is. I don't know so, if that's JavaScript, the, the spread. Or no, no. C sharp that, thing as well. That's a C sharp thing. That's with ranges. So C sharp eight introduced ranges. And it actually is telling us right here can't implicitly convert type system.range to int. So if we had a conversion, um, maybe we could say this dot and um, I thought there was a thing with range where you could say like is in range or something. Mm. Uh, so since it's a range type and we're saying zero dot dot three, so that's an, uh, a range. Um, but yeah, if there, it would, imagine if we just, you know, let me see, we're going to hack, but this is going to be fun. Let's try this. All right, so do a public. Uh, class uh, extensions. So this needs to be a static class. Static class extensions. Um, we're going to say public static uh, bool um, is in range. This range range uh, int number. And we're going to say. What is it going to be expressed as? Uh, if range, yeah, what does range have available? And start if, all right, so we can just do this. So if, <coughs> whoops, if um, the range dot start is greater than or equal to number. And it's a new line. And range dot uh, end. Oops, I want the little range. Dot end is less than or equal to number, right? So that's is in range. So now we could use that here and say dot is in range. Oh no, but we'd have to pass in the actual passengers. Um. See if we can do this. This is gonna be fun. Oh, and you don't feel like you have to solve it on stream. I was just more curious than anything. Mm -hmm. um, but but now you've challenged him. Yeah, now I feel very challenged. When here, wait. Da, 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 da. When If this compiles, I'll be happy. No, no. Um, does that need to be banged out? Nope. So many things are going wrong here. <laughs> Why does it not like that? Can that be an, it can't be a nested class. Oh, it's not in the same namespace. Now we're getting the namespaces. We need to have a namespace around all of this so it picks that up. Blah! Press buttons. Let's hype, uh, tab this out. Wait for it. And if anyone online sees... So Blackbeard and Matt says, don't worry about it now. He's going to send some stuff over. Um, yes, that would be amazing, Matt. Thank you. And he's also, he's also laughing at you, Dave. He is. No, that's great. Uh, it does not exist. Why does it not exist? That should totally exist. The name exists don't exist in the context. Um, so this range, range, and boy, if I could just figure this out, range, start, number, well. Yeah. So my next question to you, David, would be is uh, when, or I guess even better than that, where should folks go to learn about these C Sharp 9 features? I suspect they're not officially documented yet. Yeah, there's a there's a blog post by um, Mads. Uh, I have to let me pull up my Twitter real quick because I retweeted it and it's there. Wait for it. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. John Galloway, click. Oh, the stream. Everything is so slow. So welcome to C Sharp Nine. So there's an official dev blogs. Dot Microsoft com where Mads himself actually talks about a bunch of the things that I wasn't even able to show off here. Um, and that's where I encourage people to go. Cool. Nice. 
Um, one last question for you while we're still on the C sharp topic. So you had uh, demonstrated uh, the C sharp nine records feature. Is this the feature I'm thinking of that could essentially replace data transfer objects? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Um, if if I if I'm thinking about it correctly, yeah. I mean, because Mads actually specifically fielded some questions around uh, one of the major concerns around DTOs, which would be you know serialization and how do those work? And uh, absolutely, it, it would work the way you'd expect. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking of the case where I'm developing an app, and it just seems like a lot of work to create a, a new class that has maybe just two or three properties in it. Right. Um, this records feature is really appealing for a use case like that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's kind of where my where my EF question came from is is I'm thinking like okay, do, do can we plug these in as like the entity objects in in EF somehow? Yeah, I, I would imagine so. And I I the reason I'm hesitant is cuz I and playing with it in a browser using a, a, a feature branch of the Roslyn compiler. So, you know what I mean? So it's kind of hard to be like, yes, absolutely. That's the way it works. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I would, I would imagine so. All right. Very cool. What else did we want to talk about? looks like we got about 13 minutes remaining on the stream. I'm going to um, stop screen my, sharing my screen now. Any other cool features um, folks saw announced at Build? Uh, you know, even if anyone in the chat wanted to chime in, is there something cool you saw? We're curious, what excited you? So I have something that, that did excite me. Um, I saw the announcement that Teams is going to support NDI mm -hmm. video feeds yeah yeah that's gonna be cool because i know that we've gone back and forth about teams versus skype versus which one's better for streaming and how problematic they can all be and yeah yeah i mean hands down i mean i i've, I've talked with fritz about this a couple of times and hands down the 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 best experience right now for doing streaming with you know everybody being remote like this is something that outputs ndi video like skype but of course you get all the warts that you get with skype skype is a great platform don't get me wrong and and uh i don't you know i don't want to uh uh you know um cast aspersions at, at our own product i i I've, <laughs> no seriously i've used skype as my personal preferred communicator you know, for, for forever. Um, you know, my kids are all like, oh, dad, you need to get on Discord. I'm like, okay, I have Discord. I use Discord for my <laughs> weekly D&D games. I'm not logged into Discord all the time like I am logged into Skype. So uh, I, I have a soft spot for Skype, but um, it's like the only thing out there that is freely available that does these NDI output feeds that we can integrate into OBS for the stream. And right. they, they announced that, uh, you know, I don't know if it's the pandemic, you know, causing people to have to work from home more or whatever, but they, they, they announced that, that NDI video feeds are going to be something that they, they add as a feature to Teams, you know, at some point in the future, which is going to make life easier for streamers everywhere. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I know I focus on a lot of the uh, the C sharp stuff because I just have a soft spot for that. But there was also another really cool announcement from Scott Hunter about .NET. Um, you know, obviously converging into .NET five, and that's a major uh, update. But then they actually were discussing Maui. And for those who are unfamiliar, Maui is the was it the multi-platform user interface, something Mo something like that. Mo Multi-platform application user interface sounds right because it's it's yeah M A U I. Yeah, I just spelled I, just like the Hawaii location. Yeah, and I thought as, as a result of that, like the entire .NET team, we we get to go to Maui on vacation for like a month for free, right? That's that's how that works. Oh, they told you that? I didn't think <laughs> you were invited. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Being Cats that you guys are both on build, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cam, he knows. <laughs> yeah, they fixed uh, the glitch. You know, so I had mentioned Windows Terminal early on, and again, that's something that really excited me. Uh, what I can do is I can try sharing my uh, my screen here. Bring up Terminal. 
do it. Uh, yeah, I want to. I want to show just, up your your posh get and oh my posh scenario. Uh -huh. So, you know, just for folks who haven't seen the Windows Terminal, uh, this is one of the lesser Scots borrowing an idea from uh, Mr. Hanselman, uh, the greater Scott. Uh, what I have here is, you know, again, just the standard Windows Terminal. Um, I actually have a couple of things going on here that you would not see in the standard installation. Um, so I'm using the PowerShell Terminal, and you notice really three distinct things across the top. I've got, you know, my um, username or my alias, uh, followed by my machine name. I've got the current directory that I'm um, currently in, and I've got a branch name. Um, this is actually a Git repository that I'm uh, looking at locally. And then on the far right of my screen, I have this timestamp. That timestamp is indicating um, the last time that any command was run. And what I had done here is I just cleared the screen and it's telling me, hey, you last cleared the screen with the CLS command at 11.32. Um, I'm in the CDT time zone. But, um, you know, to get this uh, styling that I have here, the blue bar and the green bar, um, that's actually a, a plugin called Oh My Posh. And I'll actually put that in the chat for folks that are interested. Um, oh my posh is what that's called. And as I actually integrated with another extension for Git, the Git CLI called um, posh Git. I'll put that in the chat as well. So to be clear, posh Git is what is telling me the current branch that I am on. Um, oh my posh is giving me all of the theming that you're seeing here. And one of the cool things with Windows Terminal is you can actually use the new Cascadia code font that they released um, along with this tool. I happen to be using the Cascadia code powerline font here. And you can configure that actually up in your settings. So in this little uh, little carrot drop down here, you can go to your settings. But before I go there, notice all these other terminals that I've wired up. And I've got uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux running on this machine. I've got uh, Ubuntu um, that I can launch with WSL. What version of Ubuntu are you running? Uh, 20, let me look, 20 dot 20. something, I believe. 20.4. 20.04, yeah. yep. Yeah, yeah, okay. So again, this is launching uh, WSL using the Ubuntu distribution. Um, so you know, if I had a need to test something, say with the .NET Core CLI on Ubuntu, I could certainly do that pretty easily from here. If I exit, well, before I exit back out, notice you know the tabbed user interface here. I used to be a huge commander user. Um, you, you got me actually using Commander. I remember that because I, I was a big fan of that as well. Commander was amazing just for the fact that you could have this tabbed user interface. As soon as I saw Windows Terminal was released just in an early preview, I shifted over immediately and stopped using Commander. Um, there's no longer any compelling use cases for it for me. But if I exit out of this and go back to what I was going to show you, the settings for my terminal here, it's actually just a JSON file at this time. The team does plan to make a user interface for the settings, similar to what you've seen with VS Code, where you can, you know, it started off as a JSON file like this to maintain settings. And over time, they created a, a screen on top of that to manage all of the settings. You're going to see the same thing happen here, but of course, that's going to take time. If can, you... I, can I comment real quick on that? Go Just ahead. Th the fact that it's JSON rather than a YAML file, I feel like there's been so many, uh, you know, systems coming out and software and frameworks and platforms and everyone's, you know, it seemed like we went from XML to JSON to then YAML and I cannot stand YAML. I get so frustrated with YAML. Like if the tabs are incorrect, things stop working. I feel like we need more support and tooling. I'm sorry, I'm going to jump off my soapbox real quick, but I'm happy it's JSON. Continue. <laughs> no, 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 just to just, I, I'm not going to go any further into that. I'm just going to agree. Uh, white, significant white space sucks. Yeah, and I'm not going to dive into it either because my feelings are the same about YAML. <laughs> um, completely agree. I am you know, relieved that this is JSON we're looking at. 
Anyways, moving along to things that matter. Um, <laughs> line 12 here. Um, this is uh, where I am configuring my custom font face, my font family that's used for all of the terminals I have configured here, all the shells I've configured. Uh, Cascadia code PL. PL stands for power line, and you can see I am increasing that font size to 16. I point this setting out because that is what is needed to get that theming that you see here, the, the blue uh, and the green with the nice shapes in there. Now you might wonder, okay, so VS Code has an integrated terminal. Um, can you accomplish something similar to this over there and get the same styling? The answer is actually yes, you can. And there's a trick there as well. So if I go back to my settings, um, we're looking at the Windows terminal settings here. And, you know, again, note the font that I'm using. Um, if we go to the preferences for VS Code and look at its settings, I'm actually going to toggle over to the JSON file. Notice I'm doing something very similar over there. I'm configuring the Cascadia Code Powerline font specifically for the integrated terminal in VS Code. And so if I launch the terminal, just go up here, launch the terminal. Notice you get the same kind of styling there. <gasps> That's so Mind cool. blown, right? So let me actually navigate into, where am I? I can't think of a good directory right now, but you get the point. You know, you'd get the same styling over there. This is the detail that a lot of folks miss in okay. VS Code. Okay. They come in here and they see weird looking characters in the terminal and this Got is it. the secret sauce here line 15 that's awesome can, can um, you can you go to like your your docs um what your your docs directory or something and, and like dirty a file just to yeah see. let's let's do that so working... you can go back over to the terminal for that right the terminal yeah i could let me try it here though because i think folks might want to see i think this is one of the lesser talked about areas is how you can use this in vs code as well sure so if i go to my docs repo you notice i get oh, the same like... theming there i've got you know, posh git and oh my posh both working together do uh, a git status git status uh, and I love the timestamp thing. I think it's ironic that that timestamp is right there and available because if you recall a few episodes ago, I was like showing off like this ridiculous little alias that I created in my Git console. And it's like, people already figured this out. Why not use their stuff? <laughs> yep. You know, just to show off Posh Git a little bit, if you've never seen that before, I could create a new branch here. Uh, a feature branch off of master, let's say. So I could say git checkout dash b my awesome branch. And you can see that now posh git is telling me I am on that feature branch that I created. Okay. That's awesome. Uh, move back over to master, and again the indicator changes to show me the active branch. And then just for fun here, we're gonna since we're almost out of time, do git checkout hyphen. Let's check out hyphen. And then if you do it again, up enter. So get checkout hyphen is like a little kind of pro tip here for everyone to quickly navigate back and forth between your most recently uh, visited branch. Hmm. Yep. So uh, if you're interested in the theming um, with Oh My Posh that I've shown you here, um, I would recommend you check out Scott Hanselman's uh, blog and just search for Oh My Posh and you will find uh, a lot of the things that I was talking about. Again, the detail that's going to be missing there in that blog post is how you uh, wire this up in VS Code. Just to recap, it's line 15 here in your VS Code settings that would fix the, the ASCII codes. Um, that you see otherwise. You should throw together a tweet with a screenshot of those two places. Mm -hmm. Well, and LQDev1 points out that there's a, 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 a extension he saw earlier that, that will sync settings across uh, Visual Studio Code on different machines. So that that could be really useful to not have to re, re, oh, reconfigure figure. this. Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you for sharing that. I wasn't aware of that. Cool. Well, I, I, I read our time box. Um, 
this has been a great episode. This was a lot of fun. I didn't realize that time went by that quickly. <laughs> no, it was it was a blast, guys. So, uh, what did we talk about? We talked about uh, we talked about announcements we saw at Build, Terminal, Team stuff, uh, C Sharp stuff. You had some great demos, Dave. Thanks. Um, and uh, and it, what, was there any? What else did what did we talk about? We just had so much in the show. We talked very briefly about uh, code spaces for VS. Code spaces, yep. Um, you know, another big announcement we didn't even touch on was the uh, Azure static file hosting. I forget the official name of the service. We talked about how much YAML sucks. Yeah, yep, yeah, that's yep, one of the YAML things. YAML sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's a good spot to leave it off. Um, right, right. So uh, with that, uh, thank you everybody for showing up to uh, another episode of the .NET Docs. Please tune in next week. We don't have any announcements yet for what we're going to be featuring next week, but uh, uh, we're sure it'll be something great. And we look forward to seeing you then. We're going to get better at that. We're going to get better at that. <laughs> All right. So long.